we want to set the record straight. So for this webinar, we partnered with one of the true straight shooters on ETFs, Gus Sauter, to try to separate fact from fiction. Gus is in the unique position of being from a company that offers both ETFs and traditional mutual funds, so he has no particular ax to grind, and he's going to present some thought-leading research today on the true ETF, the true influence that ETFs are having on the market. The format of today's webinar is simple. For the first 30 minutes, Dave, Gus, and I are going to present a series of slides that cover some of the biggest issues that have been raised about ETFs. We're going to lay out what problems we think are real and what problems are not. We're going to talk potential solutions. Then, following the presentation, we'll have 30 minutes of audience Q&A where you can ask questions of any of us. We anticipate a lively Q&A session. As a participant in this webinar, you're invited to ask questions of me and my panelists using the Q&A tool at the bottom right of your webinar browser. Please don't wait until the end of the webinar to ask questions. Ask them throughout as they occur to you. We'll collate the questions and answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. We always get asked this by participants, so I'll say it up front. A recorded version of this webinar, along with the slides, will be made available on our website, indexuniverse.com, a few days after this webinar is completed. As a participant in the webinar, we will alert you by email when those slides and that recording are posted. With that, let's get started. One thing is for sure about ETFs. They are without a doubt in the headlines. The negative reporting around ETFs started in earnest around September 2010 when a small think tank named Bogan Associates published what I thought was an ill-conceived white paper postulating about ETFs collapsing. Bogan noted that certain ETFs have more than 100% of their total shares outstanding sold short and wondered aloud if a massive series of redemptions of that ETF could cause all its assets to disappear. Now, the Bogan report was built on a false, false premise and a poor understanding of how shorting works, and it was quickly debunked by serious critics. But despite the flaws, it caught fire in the media, and ever since, there has been a drumbeat of negative reports on ETFs. The funds have been blamed for driving up correlations in the market, increasing volatility, defrauding investors, raising systemic risk, and even, at one point, ruining modern capitalism by making it impossible for companies to go public. The last accusation was raised by Harold Bradley of the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, and it garnered enough attention that it led to Senate congressional hearings. The report's author, Harold Bradley, along with representatives from iShares and NASDAQ, were invited to testify to the U.S. Senate about the risks ETF posed to investors and to the future of the American economy. And while most observers dismissed much of Bradley's testimony, he made a number of large accusations while admitting he had no statistics in part to back them up. The very fact that the testimony took place shows the seriousness with which ETF issues are being taken. So why all the scrutiny? Well, the first reason is simply growth. ETFs are one of the fastest growing financial instruments in the world. There are now more than 1,400 ETFs on the market in the U.S. alone, and as you can see in the little chart at the bottom of this slide, that growth has hockey sticked in recent years. There have been 111 new ETFs launched in 2012 alone, on pace for an all-time record of new launches, and there are another 680 funds in registration at the SEC today. Importantly, all of these new listings have pushed the boundaries of what can be offered to investors in a fund-like package, whereas the vast majority of traditional mutual funds focus on beta-1 equity and bond exposure, ETFs provide exposure to stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, asset allocation, and alternative strategies. There are ETPs that provide exposure to live cattle futures and products that provide exposure to gold. You can get hedge fund exposure or exposure to volatility. And as ETFs have opened up these new areas of the market, they've done so in a regulatory framework designed for plain vanilla beta exposure. This rub between fast-moving innovation and slow-moving regulation is a source of many of the concerns that exist in the market today. The other primary source of concern is this, competition. Consider the raw numbers. In 2011, investors pulled $33 billion out of traditional mutual funds while plowing almost $120 billion into ETFs. In 2010, 
That number was $240 billion in outflows for funds and more than $120 billion in inflows for ETFs. In 2009, the same story, slight negative flows for mutual funds and more than $100 billion flooding into ETFs. If you add those together, that's a $600 billion delta in favor of ETFs over mutual funds in just the past three years. If you consider that the average expense ratio on a mutual fund right now is about 80 basis points, you're talking about $4.8 billion in annual revenue disappearing from traditional fund companies. Anytime you see this sort of competitive shift, you're bound to see people lash out, and that's part of what's happening here. ETFs are a threat to traditional mutual funds, and they're growing quickly with $1.1 trillion in assets in the U.S. alone. But let's not forget that that $1.1 trillion in assets actually understates ETFs' influence. ETFs are not just owned assets, they're traded, and their role in the trading market is actually larger than that $1.1 trillion number indicates. In fact, ETFs regularly represent around 25% of the total value of traded securities in the U.S. To repeat, nearly one in four dollars that trades hands each day on the American stock exchanges is in ETFs. So what's the truth here? Are ETFs the best thing ever or a scourge of global capitalism? The answer is complex, and in this webinar, we're going to hit a lot of the hard issues head on. And that's where Dave Nodick comes in. Dave? Thanks, Matt. So my job today is kind of fun and a little unusual. Um, I'm usually making presentations about all the great things that ETFs have done for investors, um, trying to provide data to help investors pick the best ETF for a particular goal. But today I'm actually cast in the role of being a bit of a foil. And I'm going to point out a few places where ETFs can and really have tripped some investors up. So I want to start by looking at the biggest explosion that's happened in ETF land lately, and that's TVIX. TVIX is the Velocity Shares 2X VIX Futures ETF. And it's, it's pretty straightforward on the surface. It promises to deliver you twice the daily return of a theoretical investment in the S&P 500 Volatility Index. Now, for many investors, the whole idea of buying an ETF, or in this case, an ETN, that promises something like that might sound crazy. But for traders, there's definitely been a place for products like this. So what happened? Why did TVIX end up in the headlines? It really just comes down, as so many things do with ETFs, to the whole creation and redemption process. And I thought it would be worth going through the tale of TVIX here to talk about how sometimes things are not what they seem. So in this case, there's a bank that underwrites this ETN, and that's Credit Suisse. And they decided that they could no longer handle the amount of risk that it required to keep issuing this ETN on February 22nd. If you think about it this way, since the ETN doesn't actually own anything, it's a note, that's the exchange-traded note, so it's just like any other bond, Credit Suisse has to pay out this pattern of returns, this volatility-based return, and so they have to have some way to hedge off that risk. So we assume that they hedge that risk by going out into the futures market of their own account uh, and, and holding the futures just like a regular ETF would. Now, normally, this kind of structure is a great deal for investors. You're getting ex essentially perfect tracking error for that ETN with the bank taking all of the tracking risk, and on top of that, you get long-term 15% capital gains treatment. In this case, however, on February 22nd, Credit Suisse said enough. They just didn't want to or couldn't get any more exposure to offset the growth of the TVIX ETN, so they shut it down for creations. So what happened is what happens any time a fund, an ETF or an ETN, closes for new money. It starts to trade like a closed-end fund, and that meant big premiums. And once it started trading at a premium, lots of people wanted to short it. After all, people expect those premiums to collapse. So the blue line here is the traded price. The red line here is the net asset value, and you can see that premium starting to grow. So once it starts trading at that premium and people want to short it, eventually it simply becomes too hard to borrow anymore. It becomes effectively impossible to short anymore. And that's what happened here on March 20th. They came too hard to borrow, went on that threshold list. By March 22nd, the premium had reached almost 100%, meaning it was twice as expensive as the net asset value would lead, would lead you to believe. 
So, so far, nothing seems all that amiss. Investors should be here, uh, you know, looking at this and, and saying, wow, why would I be buying this? But then what happened was Credit Suisse, for reasons of their own, decided later in that same day, on March 22nd, after the market closed, that they would go ahead and reopen it and let people give them more money effectively. Uh, so what's important to note here is a few things. Uh, obviously, we saw that premium collapse, uh, and it collapsed back down to the point where it's basically trading at fair value. But there are a few points in this cautionary tale. The first is, this happened to be an ETN, and a lot of the tales, the, the headlines have been about this being an exchange-traded note. Uh, but the same thing has happened in ETFs before. We saw it with uh, the market vectors Egypt funds back during the Arab Spring, EGPT, had to close because they couldn't get access to the Egyptian market, traded at a huge premium, those markets opened up, collapsed back down. The second thing here is that if for some reason you were actually holding TVIX for the long term, which honestly was probably not a great idea to start with, your experience from sort of point A to point B on this chart was just fine. I mean, in the sense that you lost 6% of your money, but you should have lost 16% of your money. That was the fair value. The only people who sort of were abused in this situation was anybody who was, for whatever reason, actually buying this product when it was at 100% premium. So the moral of the story uh, is quite simple, which is you need to know what you're buying, and you need to check your intraday net asset values, and you need to read prospectuses. And that sounds a little bit like motherhood and apple pie. Which brings us to another real issue, which is sometimes transparency isn't all it's cracked up to be. Right? We've, you've probably heard us say on these webinars over and over again, read the prospectuses, know what you own, uh, you know, check into these funds before you start to buy them. But sometimes that's not so easy. Let's look at a really simple example, expense ratios. Expense ratios are kind of like the gospel of fund investing, whether it's ETFs or mutual funds. It's the single most important determinant of your returns. Buying a cheaper fund generally means you get much closer to what you expect. However, they can also be wrong, or at least in this case, misleading. So let's look at this one. The expense ratios for 27 absolute return ETFs, so all 27 that are currently available on the market. And this is an area where a lot of new ETF growth has happened, a lot of pushing of that envelope. These are funds that are competing directly with hedge funds at charging, you know, 2 and 20 percent. And as you might expect, the fees are pretty high. They range from about 40 basis points over on the left all the way up to a staggering 3 percent for AGLS on the right. In other words, these are expensive funds. But they're actually not expensive enough when you get under the hood. This chart shows the actual all-in fees for these funds once you've dug through the prospectus and looked at what the actual expenses are. Now, to be clear, none of the issuers are hiding anything here. This data is all available in this prospectus. But by practice, there are fees and expenses that simply don't show up in a classic expense ratio statistic that you would see on a website or a fact sheet. And that's because the way expense ratios are calculated harkens back to an era with, which didn't even comprehend the idea that there might be these absolute return funds someday. So let's take something like BTA in the middle of this. That's the one with the highest red bar. It's an interesting little fund, and it charges an interesting little fee of 81 basis points. It's a market-neutral ETF from Quant Shares. But the strategy, because it's market-neutral, has extensive shorts. And when you short something, you actually have to cover the dividend payments, right? If you're shorting IBM, you've got to cover IBM's dividend. Now, if you dig into the prospectus, you'll see that Quant Shares estimates that to be about 2.46%. And that puts you up at around a 3% expense ratio, even, with a number, um, e even when the number reported on, say, Bloomberg is only 81 basis points. So should that 2.46% be included in your fee with Big Air? Maybe not. Um, you know, after all, the Vanguard total market ETF doesn't get to offset its expenses with the expected dividends it, it plans on getting from holding stocks. But most investors probably don't think about the expense of paying those dividends on the short side, even while they might be aware of it on the upside when they're holding those things long. And these kinds of hidden fees and expenses pop out throughout these more exotic ETFs. There's even one series of ETNs out there that charges a weekly fee, a weekly hedging fee, which makes it actual annualized expenses close to 5%. Different story, same moral. As soon as you step outside the plain vanilla ETFs, you have to dig and you have to dig deep.
but even in the plain vanilla ETFs, you can have problems. Now, this chart looks at eight ETFs competing in the REIT market. Honestly, it's a pretty dull, plain vanilla market. And the light bar here is just the plain old expense ratio with reds on the high side on the left and the Vanguard fund on the right, VNQ on the right with just 12 basis points. Um, but in this case, these expenses are actually too high. The darker blue line here represents the actual annual tracking difference. That is, if you actually just held these funds for a year, on average, how far off the index would you be? Now, your expectation would be you should be off by about the same as the expense ratio. If they're doing a good job tracking the index, that should be the only thing that's the, the only headwind you have. And in the case of the cheapest funds, they're actually doing better than the expense ratio. So how is that happening? The reason generally is that there are two ways to beat your index. The first is just skillful portfolio management uh, and optimization. Uh, you can just do better on your rebalances or hold the right subset of the index, and you can eke out some positive returns. Second big way is securities lending. If uh, ICF or any of these other funds has a REIT that's in high demand from short sellers, they can loan it out and they can collect a small fee. But even that doesn't tell the whole story because most of us will buy our ETFs out in the open market and we'll have to pay a spread too. And the darkest blue bar here is that spread. And as you can see, there are really two camps in the REIT space. They're the really good traders on the right that have razor thin spreads and the ones on the left that really have quite wide spreads. It's important to recognize that these numbers hop around all the time. You can look at BNQ, for instance, and as of Friday, you'll see it barely moves in a tiny range. Something like RTL, though, has high average spreads, but also very volatile spreads. And these spreads really matter. This is the round trip cost, right? What it actually costs over the course of a year to get in and out of a REIT exposure. And you can see there's a big swing here, right? Things that were expensive before now look really expensive. Things that might have been cheaper now look really cheap, right? This makes a big difference in your returns, and it's not necessarily obvious art. Now, while things like spreads and expenses really just highlight how bad the data can be on ETFs, honestly, and incidentally, the data can be even worse for mutual funds, uh, perhaps the biggest real risk most ETF investors get caught up with is what I call expectational risk. That's the case where the ETF does exactly what it says it's going to do, uh, but it turns out to be entirely unexpected in the mind of the investor. Probably the clearest point on this front is leveraged and inverse funds, which were the whipping boy for ETFs uh, back in 2010, and they continue to make the occasional headline. Virtually all of these products promise to pay you some multiple of a fairly standard index over the course of a single day. So you want S&P 500 times three, that's great, you get it for today. The problem is that these funds uh, rebalance every day, which leads to complex and unexpected patterns of returns when they're held for anything more than a day. They'll underperform during volatile markets and overperform in a, a simple trend flow volatility. And in this chart, you can see this in spades, and frankly, we could have picked any section of the market and you'd see pretty much the same chart. Here we're looking at financials. The red line here is the select sector spider financial over the course of the last year, and you can see it's down about 3% but it got there through a pretty windy road. Now the Direction Triple Bull Financials ETF, a 3X on the same index, is the green line. It's down 29%, when you might have actually expected it to only be down 9%. That's three times that negative 3% return. But because it didn't go down in a straight line, that volatility made the returns even worse. Even more surprisingly for some investors would be that the Direction Triple Bear Financials Fund, the blue line, is down 48%. In fact, it's the worst of the three. But a simple interpretation of what minus 3x this index should be might make you think you should be up 9% on the year. And the interesting thing here is these are all excellent products doing exactly what they say they're going to do, providing that daily leveraged or inverse exposure. But if you're holding it for more in the day, you're in for a pretty rude surprise. Why does it happen? I'm sure most of you know, I'll just run through the math and then you, uh, you know, if, if you've got two things that start at 100 and one thing is gonna go up 10%, but the, the inverse fund's gonna go down 200%, uh, you know, go down 20% on the next day, you end up with these very different numbers. And when they balance back out, 
uh, it's going to have that erosion factor on the minus 200% ETF. So even though you can start with day one and end at day three with something that seemingly should just be up 10%, down 10%, and end up with very different patterns of returns. They're doing exactly what they say they do again, but it's not always clear to investors this is what they're getting. And I'll just give one last example of this expectational problem, and then I'll hand it back to Matt and Gus. Um, let's take a quick look at a commodity situation. ETFs have been a huge boon for investors looking for diversification, opening up all sorts of new asset classes, commodities included. And commodities has been a big recipient of new investor cash. But commodity ETF investors may not really understand all the time how commodities markets actually work. So this chart shows natural gas so far this year, just four and a half, five, five five and a half months. The red line is actually the price of natural gas, which you really can't invest in unless you line up a tanker truck out in the Midwest. And the spot price for natural gas is down about 37%. That's the baseline. Now, the number one way commodities ETF investors have been playing natural gas is to simply go out and buy the front month's natural gas futures contracts. That's the actual liquid market for natural gas. But because the price of that front month contract has consistently been higher than the current spot price, a situation called contango, investors in front month's natural gas ETFs like UNG have been riding this gray line down, worse than the actual underlying asset, the natural gas itself. However, investors that bought a strip of futures, that is not front month future, but the second and third and fourth and all the way out for a year, a strategy used by UNL, another ETF tra tracking natural gas on the top line, they've actually done better than the underlying index. They're only down 30%. That's a 15% dispersion of returns inside a single asset class with just a five month window. And again, each one of these ETFs is doing exactly what they promised to do. Matt, I'll hand that back to you. Sure. Thanks, Dave. So that th that covers some of the expectational errors that investors make. Uh, but before we bring in Gus to go into systemic risks, um, I, I want to remember that or remind everyone that we're really talking about the far end of the pool here. About 87% of all assets invested in ETFs right now are invested in beta-1 equity and fixed income products, the plain vanilla exposures for which most regulations are designed and which, in our opinion, ETFs do a supremely good job of providing exposure to. If you add physical gold funds like GLD into the mix, you're way over 90%. The edge cases, the leverage, the inverse, the commodity futures, the volatility exposures, make up just about 10 uh, or 13% of your total overall assets, depending on how you count. In fact, I'd say the vast majority of investment in ETFs looks something like this chart. This, of course, is SPY, the S&P 500 Spiders ETF, the first ETF launched in the U.S., which came to market in January of 1993, nearly 20 years ago. And it's done just a spectacular job at doing exactly what it says it does, delivering the precise returns of the S&P 500 with no blow-up risk at extraordinarily low cost and with no tracking error. This is an investor's friend, and again, it's been on the market and has been the most traded security in the world for nearly 20 years. With $1.1 trillion invested in ETFs, about $1 trillion of that is invested in plain vanilla funds like this, where it's difficult to tease apart the return the ETF has provided from the index that it aims to track. So are ETFs broken? I, I think the real answer is no. The vast majority of ETFs are WYSIWYG products. What you see is what you get. They provide clean exposure to the markets with few hidden risks, and they've been doing it in some cases for decades. But what is true without question is that there are risks. Many ETFs, and particularly newer ETFs, push the boundaries of what investors can be offered in easy-to-buy products. Investors can now gain exposure to leverage without the benefit of a margin account. They can now gain exposure to options without the benefit of an options account. They can buy commodities without necessarily claiming to have a true understanding of the futures market. Is that right? Or should there be some sort of gate that requires investors to acknowledge the risks before they buy in? Here at Index Universe, we've been building an ETF analytics system designed to help investors understand ETFs before they buy. Uh, we'll be doing a separate standalone webinar about the system on Thursday. And as a participant in today's webinar, you'll receive a personal invite from me later today inviting you to attend. I, I think our tool will help many investors 
um, save themselves from making these mistakes. But I do think that the most sophisticated ETFs deserve some sort of gating, or at least that that conversation needs to, needs to happen in this space. Investors need to make sure that they understand the risks of these products before they buy. ETFs used properly are wonderful tools for investors, providing low-cost, institutional caliber exposure to markets around the world. But as with any new product, um, they bear close watching and extensive education. And, and with that, I'd love to bring in Gus Sauter from Vanguard to talk about some of the additional risks we hear about in ETFs and maybe dispel a few of the myths that exist around, uh, around there in the market. Gus? Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, First of all, you touched on this earlier, but uh, we've seen explosive growth in the ETF industry, and I think because of that, uh, we've seen some skepticism. Here you can see that the assets have ab absolutely exploded from uh, around $400 billion, uh, as recently as six years ago to, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, well over a trillion dollars at this point in time. At the same time, we've seen an explosion in the number of ETFs. Uh, from, again, a little under 400 to well over uh, 1,000, and, and you mentioned how many are in registration at this point. So um, there, there have been a lot of questions. As you noted, uh, uh, there have been a, a couple of uh, hearings uh, in Congress and uh, uh, a lot of concern among the investors as to whether or not ETS really could present a, a major problem. Today, I'd like to talk on uh, about three different uh, issues that have been raised. The first is market volatility and whether or not ETFs are actually making the market more volatile, uh, perhaps creating systemic risk. Uh, I'd also like to talk about stock correlations, in other words, uh, stocks moving together, uh, which we have observed, and a lot of people are saying ETFs have created that. And then finally, uh, a word about IPOs. Uh, uh, you mentioned that Harold Bradley from the Kauffman Foundation had uh, had uh, guessed that perhaps ETFs were making it more difficult for companies to go public. Uh, so first of all, starting with volatility, uh, you can see uh, from this chart that volatility spikes up from time to time, but what's uh, very noticeable is it's related to macroeconomic shocks. So we're very sensitive to the volatility that we experienced last year. Uh, first in the spring, we had uh, a, a whole uh, slew of economic shocks. First was uh, the tsunami in Japan. Uh, then we had the Arab Spring, followed by the Greek debt crisis, followed by the U.S. Uh, debt ceiling, uh, immediately followed by the downgrading of the U.S. Treasury, uh, and additional concern about uh, what, what's becoming a European debt crisis. So um, there were plenty of reasons for the market to be volatile, uh, not uh, not because ETFs have grown. And, and you can see on this chart, we've had volatility way back in time. I, I started with Vanguard 25 years ago, uh, literally two weeks before the crash of 87, which was uh, my definition of volatility, 20, down 21% in a day. Uh, but you've seen these other spikes long before the development of ETFs. So let's take a look at, uh, deeper into volatility. And uh, this current chart shows a variable that we create uh, called our economic conditions uh, uh, variable. This is something we do internally uh, for our own uh, money management and uh, economic projections. And you can see how closely that has tracked volatility, that when uh, the economic conditions um, uh, become tenuous, you see a spike up in volatility. Uh, the same is true um, when things settle down. You see the volatility settle down. Uh, the next chart uh, shows volatility in the U.S. versus volatility in Germany. Now, ETFs make up a much larger percentage of trading here in the U.S. and a larger percentage of assets as well, uh, financial assets. Uh, but here you'll see that the VIX, so, which is a volatility index or a, an estimate of volatility in the U.S. stock market, uh, I guess more specifically the S&P 500, uh, and compare that to the VDAX, which is a similar volatility measure for the German marketplace. And here you'll see that they're tremendously uh, correlated, that they're moving up and down together, spiking at the same time. Now, again, uh, ETFs are a much bigger part of our market, so shouldn't, uh, if in fact ETFs are pushing the market around, Shouldn't uh, our market be pushed much more than you'd see uh, happen in Germany? And I think, uh, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the answer to that is no, because really what's causing this 
spike in volatility is macroeconomic events, and they're, they're generally global macroeconomic events, so we're feeling it uh, in all markets of the world. And then finally, I'd like to say that uh, if we imagined that ETFs are in fact creating volatility, then what we should see is a spike in ETF trading, and that would lead to um, a, a more volatile marketplace. Uh, the blue line on this chart shows the level of trading of ETFs relative to the level of market-wide trading. So you can see here it's been roughly in the 30% range uh, and wandering down a little bit over time. But uh, it's certainly not at all correlated with the volatility in the marketplace as represented by the, the red line. And you know we're not seeing any spike in ETF trading when the volatility in the stock market is spiking up. So I really don't think there's any evidence to, uh, to say that, that the growth of ETFs have at all uh, led to any, uh, any increase in volatility in the marketplace. Uh, secondly, I'd like to address the question about correlation. Uh, have ETFs led to an increase in the correlation among stocks? So this was a big concern last year that uh, stocks were uh, all going up and down together, and, that, uh, and we absolutely could measure that correlations of stocks, pairwise correlations, um, incre increased quite dramatically. Well, I'd like to point out that there's a, a, a simple formula, well, uh, seemingly simple formula that um, can estimate the correlation, uh, pairwise correlation of stocks. And that's, uh, it's essentially the correlation is a function of uh, market volatility and also the dispersion of cross-sectional stock returns. In other words, uh, let's say the market's up 20%, some stocks will be up 30, others will be up 10. So you have this dispersion of returns around the market rate of return. And those two factors will determine the correlation is given by this uh, uh, formula here. If we go to the next slide, you'll see what happens. So, so in the top part of this, uh, I've made the assumption that the dispersion goes to zero, that uh, in fact, if the market's up 20%, all stocks are up 20%, there's no dispersion of returns. Or if the market's down 20%, they're all down 20%. If that is the case, then correlation will go to one. So that would have to be a condition, or the alternative condition would be if volatility itself spiked up to infinity, then again you would see the correlation would go to one. So let's take a look and see what's actually happened. Uh, and the dispersion of returns is measured in this chart, and there are three different measures, uh, three months, six months, and 12 months. So the three months looks at the returns of all stocks over the prior three months, and what the, the standard deviation or dispersion of returns was uh, during the three-month period, that's on the, the blue line. The red line would be six-month returns, then the green line would be 12-month returns. What we see here, whether you're looking at three, six, or 12-month returns, there seems to be uh, roughly a common level of dispersion uh, along the bottom there, subject to some spikes in between. There are periods of time when the dispersion of returns really does spike up, uh, some stocks performing much better or much worse than others. And, uh, uh, but, but the normal environment is where, uh, if I look at the blue line, kind of tracing along the, the bottom of the blue line there straight across. And if you see that, you can see that the dispersion of returns that we have experienced recently is roughly in line with historical norms. So you can't conclude then that dispersion of returns is leading to that increase in correlations. And, and I've heard many active managers claim that correlations were so high last year and it made it a very difficult environment for active managers. Well, the fact of the matter is there still was a dispersion of returns. If you're an active manager, your job is to find those stocks that do outperform. And there were, um, the dispersion was very much in line with the historical norms. So, uh, so it's not the dispersion of returns that's driving uh, the correlation's higher, which means it must be the other factor. It must be volatility. And um, if we look at the next chart, we'll see that uh, uh, here we've compared index volatility is measured by the Russell 1000 index, and that's the light blue line. Compare that to the pairwise correlations, uh, the, the level of correlation in the market, which is the red line. While they don't track perfectly on top of each other, you can see that there is certainly a strong relationship between uh, an increase in volatility and an increase in correlation.
So in fact, uh, I do conclude that uh, the increase in correlation that we saw last year was due to the extreme volatility uh, that we experienced uh, throughout um, probably two-thirds of the year. The, the final thing I'd like to touch on uh, right now would be the reduction in IPOs. So it is absolutely true that there have been fewer IPOs uh, over the past uh, decade. You can see that uh, there were quite a few IPOs in the 1990s. Uh, of course, a lot of those were Internet-related, uh, a lot of companies being formed. Uh, and then we went into the uh, the tech rack, uh, uh, the tech bubble bursting. And, uh, you know, clearly when the market pulls back, as it did very significantly at that point in time, it makes it much less uh, appealing for a company to issue shares and, and go public. So we naturally saw a decline in the level of IPO activity in the uh, 2000 to 2003 time range. And that's uh, similar to the prior uh, bear market that we saw in 1990 with a low level of IPO activity. Um, we started coming out of that bear market in 2003, but Sarbanes-Oxley was put in place um, in the middle of 2002. Sarbanes-Oxley was a piece of regulation uh, that made it much more expensive for companies to uh, uh, to be public. And in fact, what we have seen is a tremendous consolidation in the number of companies that are public and a reduction in IPOs. So, uh, it's, it's very expensive now to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, I would note that um, in the 1990s, uh, a total market index uh, had about uh, seven, let's say 7,200 stocks in it. Today, that same total market index would have about 3,800 stocks. So we've seen tremendous consolidation, uh, I think in large part due to Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, and, um, and that, I think, also has impacted IPO activity. So while we do see a pickup in activity as the market recovered, it was certainly nowhere near the level of the 1990s. And then, of course, in the uh, in the last recession, the, the financial crisis, so we saw another downtick in IPO activity, which one would expect uh, some recovery from there and actually reasonable IPO activity this year. But again, I would conclude that there are other events that have led to um, the reduction in IPOs. I, I, I see no reason why it would be related to uh, the growth of ETFs. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and turn it back over to you, Matt, and, and Dave. Thanks, Gus. Uh, fantastic slides there. Uh, I'll remind everyone, as a participant in this webinar, you can ask questions of Gus, uh, Dave, or I using the Q&A screen at the bottom uh, right of your webinar browser. Uh, we'll collate them and answer as many as we can. Uh, starting right now, we're getting some, some great questions from the audience. I, I'm, I, I'm going to steal uh, the first question myself, Gus, and ask it of you. You know, you presented just some, some, some awesome raw data sort of laying out a very intuitive case for what actually has been driving spikes in volatility, which is to say, you know, huge market-moving events. I guess I wanted to know from your perspective, Given that that is, is both intuitive and the data so strongly supports it, why do you think ETFs uh, sort of get accused uh, of, of driving up volatility or get accused of, of, of causing the rise in correlation? What's, what's behind that? Well, I think to some extent uh, there's, uh, the, the success of ETFs have just created a tremendous amount of skepticism. I've heard uh, one person quoted that uh, if it grows like a weed, it, uh, it must be a weed. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I certainly don't subscribe to that. Uh, um, there have certainly been successful products uh, in the past that uh, did not create any systemic risk or, or lead to any sort of market disruption. Um, I, you know, I think we're, we live in an environment today where we're looking for answers for just about everything and, and uh, you know, in some cases looking for blame. And uh, uh, it, it just so happens that ETFs tend to be in the crosshairs uh, at this point. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. Let me, let me take the argument to its absurd conclusion, though. Um, if everyone invested in index funds and, and you know, there was no, no money left over in active, um, surely, surely the correlations would rise to one. So, so where is that tipping point of index versus uh, active assets, and is that a is that a real risk, or is that just a, a theoretical argument that people like to throw around? 
Well, I think it is. I think it's more theoretical than real. Uh, I do think that um, indexing is actually in its infancy still. Oddly enough, uh, even as it has grown dramatically, um, I think it will grow dramatically from here. And I think the the um, the attributes are just too positive for index funds that, that they will continue to grow. Uh, but interestingly, uh, hope always uh, prevails uh, to some extent, and, and we'll, there will be people who. Uh, who will want to pursue active management, and uh, uh, and as long as there are two active managers left standing, they'll figure out what prices should be. Uh, you know, pricing is done at the margin, and um, and it's really the active managers that the price stocks. It's not index funds. Index funds are, are price takers. So uh, I, I don't worry at all about the market mechanism being um, messed up by by index funds. I just think that. Um, People will always have um, some degree of hope for uh, uh, active funds. In fact, you know, we we think active funds can be used uh, appropriately uh, to complement uh, index funds inside a portfolio. We we obviously offer active funds, so um, I, I don't worry about index funds becoming too large. It's, it's certainly not going to happen in my career, or or I believe my lifetime. I think it's worth pointing out that you know we're we're you know what we're what forty years on since since John Bogle started talking about indexing to the common man, and uh, the most indexed, uh, most invested index in the world, the S and P five hundred, uh, currently has about ten percent of the assets of the market cap of the S and P five hundred, and of that ten percent that's indexed, about ten percent of that is represented in ETF. So we're looking at one percent of the market cap of the S and P five hundred. Being owned by, uh, you know, the the various ETFs tracking that index. So, by that token, it's still it's still pretty small potatoes when you look at it that way. Absolutely. I mean, Gus, you know, one interesting question um, that I had, and then we'll get to the audience questions. Do you, do you feel there are any asset classes that sort of shouldn't be indexed, or that that maybe aren't right for the ETF clothing? Uh, you know, I mean, you, Vanguard certainly tiptoed into the ETF market, sort of thoughtfully going after specific assets. Is there a line you would draw and say, you know what, for this particular asset class or this kind of strategy, either active management or another vehicle is the right way to go? Uh, yes, there are certainly some asset classes that we are not likely to offer ETFs uh, uh, for. And um, the, way, the way we look at uh, product development, it's really whether or not we think investors can um, can understand what they're getting into. Now, the, the target market for our ETFs tends to be the financial advisor community, and we feel very comfortable that financial advisors, for the most part, uh, fully understand uh, ETFs. So uh, we, we take some comfort in that. At the same time, we, we do recognize that individual investors without uh, advice are going into the ETF marketplace and you know not understanding uh, some of the issues that you pointed out before, like the levered ETFs or inverse ETFs. And um, we tend to stay away from products where we're not sure that they're uh, uh, easily understood by, uh, say, your average investor. So there are a number of ETFs now kind of pushing the alternative space, uh, alternative betas, if you will. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, discussion internally whether or not we'd offer something like that. I think uh, actually we're going to stay away from it just because it's um, difficult for us to control uh, the distribution and whether or not there would be people investing in those types of products that really don't understand it. So we're going to stay with the really broad, uh, broad-based, uh, broadly diversified ETFs that, uh, you know, quite honestly, most investors uh, uh, have the most success with uh, in achieving their investment goals. Right. I mean, one one of the things that we've heard a lot of discussion about is should ETF as a label, uh, you know, even cover some of the more more edge cases. Uh, does Vanguard have any any thoughts on that? Do you think um, th there's a danger in labeling, or or is that really not an issue you guys concern yourself with? Well, yeah, I guess um, the one concern we have with uh, with the discussion around labeling right now is that there would be some sort of implication. That the label itself would would describe or define the amount of risk that the product has, uh, and and I would note that um, it, it's really just a label. What's being proposed would be a label around legal structure, and the legal structure itself may or may not have uh, inherent risks, but the underlying investment um, 
can be very risky in any type of structure. So uh, if people thought, well, you know, I don't want that type of exchange-traded product because it's too risky, it, it could be that that particular exchange-traded product is far less risky than another type of exchange-traded product that they, they think uh, would be appropriate for them because perhaps it's a plain vanilla exchange-traded fund, ETF. So we're, we're very concerned that investors don't fully understand uh, what uh, the various exchange-traded products uh, are. Um, we're a little concerned about uh, kind of a labeling that would, you know, maybe just describe something as an ETF or an ETN or uh, other type of, uh, of exchange-traded product because we just think people would read too much into that. Yeah, I mean, Matt, it's probably worth pointing out that the, you know, the pro shares leverage and inverse funds, which was sort of the first ETF to really, you know, make a splash for that, they're all registered 40 Act mutual fund structures, right? So, you know, those kinds of gates built purely on the backs of regulatory structure probably aren't going to make much of a difference, right? It, it really does come down, I think, back to that expectational risk. Um, uh, yeah, so gotta, absolutely. We, we've had a bunch of questions um, about sort of other areas of the market where there might be risk, or other areas of ETFs there might be risks. And, um, it, you know, so I, I'd love to toss a couple your way. Um, there have been a couple of questions about sort of the plain vanilla funds, like we talked about them, you know, whether it's a, you know, a, like a total market fund, like a VTI or something like that. Um, do, do funds like that engage in securities lending? Is there risk there? And is there a benefit to investors? Do you want to do you want to hit that one? Yeah, uh, so I think securities lending uh, it can be a very uh, nice benefit to investors uh, when uh, done prudently. So uh, uh, I'll quote uh, our head of securities lending uh, in saying that nobody's ever lost money lending securities. Uh, in fact, where they have lost money is reinvesting the collateral. So uh, very frequently when you're lending out uh, general collateral, GC, uh, you have very, very thin uh, profit margins. And what uh, some people have done in the past uh, uh, was to take a lot of risk reinvesting the collateral that they receive, and then the collateral blows up on them, and that's where they've lost money. If you, um, if you really uh, don't try to stretch uh, to get that extra, um, extra dollar, uh, then I think you can create a very prudent, uh, very uh, well-run securities lending program. Um, in, in our case, uh, um, we, we return 100% of the profit back to, uh, to the funds themselves. So it goes you know, entirely to the advantage of the investor and the fund, not to, uh, to Vanguard. Yeah, let me. Uh, I, I want to. I want to turn back to one of the things we mentioned earlier. Actually, David, I'm actually going to ask this question first of you, and then and then have Gus jump in. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the Bogan report at, at the top of the um, at the top of the session. You know, what, one of the concerns an audience member raised is that is that Bogan's assertions was effectively that ETFs actually failed in settlement. Um, and I wanted to know from your perspective: is is that really an issue? Is that part of the concern? Um, that that gets raised. Yeah, I mean that's one that comes up, and and this is more an artifact of bad uh, bad regulation and bad definitions than anything else. I mean it is true that there is a list published by the SEC of of funds that are beyond the standard settlement window of T plus three or of any security that's beyond that window, and there have been times when ETFs are on that list, and that's called the settlement failure list. The problem is that ETFs by their nature live with different settlement rules. So if a if a market maker, an AP, the guy who's in charge of making creation and redemption, and redemption works, um, is is owes securities to the system, he has a five days, not three. And there's no incentive for him to make that happen earlier necessarily. Uh, in fact, it may, he may have incentives to delay the settlement until there would be penalties, which would be a T5. So what research we've done suggests that most ETFs are, are settling on, you know, inside T plus three because they're just movements of shares within the market. Shares that are being created and redeemed often take the fourth or fifth day of settlement, which they legally have. However, they still show up on that fail list. So what we see is when an ETF has a lot of creation and redemption activity, um, which tends to mean it, you know, that underlying securities are going up or down a lot, um, 
those funds tend to show up on that fail list, but it's not true failure. It's not that those people are never delivering the shares and they have to get bought in by the NSCC. It doesn't doesn't get to that extent. At least that's been our research. I mean, Gus, do you have any any further thoughts on the you know failure to settle issue? Uh, no, you you hit it on the head, um, Dave. Uh, um, that's it exactly. I quite honestly think it was a, a tempest in a teapot. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let, let, let me let me address one other one other tempest that I hear a lot about, um, and I'll throw it first to Gus and then to Dave. And th this came from the audience as well. Um, you know, in, in the last hour of trading, people people seem to claim that um, you know, in in what are already volatile sessions, um, that ETFs have some role in pushing that volatility further um, due to rebalancing at the end of the day. Uh, maybe maybe leveraged resets. Is there any truth to that sort of end of day volatility question as opposed to the broader volatility question you, you addressed in your slides, Gus? Um, you know, we've observed perhaps a, a very slight hint of that. Uh, nothing that's statistically significant. I think, uh, uh, and I would note that it's not an ETF issue. It's an issue of, of uh, these levered funds that do need to relever uh, at the end of the day. And, and they will exacerbate a trend, uh, but it's 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 the strategy. It's not the ETF. The ETF is is just a legal uh, form for doing this. But there are lots of um, levered strategies out there that hedge funds might be pursuing, and um, and, and not just ETFs. So uh, again, it's not the legal structure of ETFs that's creating this. It's it's the strategy of uh, of leverage, but uh, but again, what we've noticed is is very very slight. It's not, uh, um, it's certainly nothing that persists. Yeah, I mean, Matt, when we, um, what, you know, when the congressional hearings were happening, we put together a briefing book, which you can still get to on our site. Um, we did a on on this effect, and it is true that the leverage and inverse funds, um, on a day when the market's up, they will always be net buyers, uh, whether or not they're levered or inverse. Interestingly, uh, it, they will always be buying with the trend or selling with the trend on a down day, and so you would expect that that's a bit of an aha, that therefore they must be ramping the close. Um, and, and indeed, if there was a vast amount of money in these leverage and inverse products, I think we would see that effect because that's certainly the way the math works. Uh, what we've seen, however, is if you actually look at trading activity on the end of the day, uh, while it often feels like uh, to investors that are watching the tape uh, that you have all of this chaos and volatility ramping at the end of the day, what we've actually seen is that whether you look at the last 30 minutes of trading or the last 15 minutes of trading or the last five minutes of trading, it's actually a coin flip about whether or not that period of time accelerates or reverses the trend you've seen all day. Um, so, it, you know, it's simply not the case that markets are ramping on the close. It may feel like that on a day when you're trading, uh, but the actual statistics show it's a coin flip about whether those trends are reverting to the mean or whether they're accelerating at the end of the day. And I think you can't underestimate human emotion. When uh, If the market's off a lot, uh, you know, there can be a little bit of a panic at the end of the day, but it has nothing to do with an ETF. It just has to do with people overreacting and, and perhaps uh, getting out uh, towards the end of the day. So, right. uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, Matt, I, I, I would actually, it, these kinds of issues, right, the, the leverage and inverse stuff, I mean, the, and, you know, Gus, I, I always think it's funny when somebody has to put math up on the screen because that's when we get accused of being, you know, the pointy-headed guys, right? I think it's a legitimate question. Maybe I'll start with you, Matt. Are ETFs just getting too complex? I mean, have we reached, have we reached that tipping point already? Huh, that, that is a great question. I mean, you know, first, of course, I'd reiterate that the vast majority of them are relatively simple. You have to... You have to pay attention to what they hold, make sure they, they're providing the exposure they claim. But most of them you can figure out. Um, there's certainly ETFs that make my head hurt um, in how they, how they <laughs> you know, move back and forth um, between different exposures. There, there's certainly ETFs that I question um, whether they should be made available with no gating to all investors, right? We have, we have rules that exist in the marketplace that, that require investors to at least say, yes, I understand these risks before they can, um, you know, take on options or take on futures. And, and with ETFs, you kind of get a workaround where anyone can trade them in their, um, you know, their Schwab account. 
um, without making those sort of statements. Uh, I, I'm not in favor of you know removing these ETFs from the market, but I do think you know whether it's whether it's regulated top down or or perhaps better you know driven bottom up by um, by you know by by thoughtful brokers and, and thoughtful um, houses. To, to ensure that there is some level of understanding of these more complex ETFs before investors buy in, uh, it doesn't seem like you should be able to work around um, sort of the gates that we've all agreed on uh, for other products simply because it's in an ETF wrapper. So I, I wouldn't say that ETFs are too complex. I love that they're providing you know low cost institutional exposure to these areas of the market, but I do think there's a required education. Um, or at least, a, a, you know, some sort of warning system to give investors a heads up that they may not be walking into something that's so WYSIWYG and that they should certainly pay attention before they buy because um, despite what people say, I definitely hear stories from investors who bought things they didn't understand. Uh, Gus, what do you think? Are, are some of the ETFs got getting too complex? You've, you've certainly, you know, avoided the more complex parts of the market, but what do you see out there? Yeah, I, I, I do think things are getting uh, complex. You you proposed um, early on in your remarks that uh, um, you have some sort of gate system, and uh, we've talked about that internally. And, uh, you know, I'd note that uh, in order to trade futures or to trade options, you have to be uh, pre-approved by your, your broker-dealer to do that. Uh, um, you know, it makes sense that uh, if you're trading something complex, and, and you noted that some of these things are getting very complex, that, you know, maybe you got to take a test to do it. And, uh, or you know, uh, uh, certify that you know what you're doing. And uh, um, you know, I, I, I predicted about uh, a decade ago. Uh, I think maybe at one of your conferences that uh, uh, that there would be consolidation in the ETF industry. And of course, things have done nothing but go uh, up since then. <laughs> uh, you know, we probably had about 200 ETFs at that point in time. Uh, but I do think that uh, we're, we're in some cases pushing the envelope here a bit far, and, and I do think we'll, we'll see consolidation. We've seen some consolidation in the industry um, already, but uh, uh, I, I think we'll see a significant amount of consolidation. That uh, Some of these things are too complex. Some of them are, are too niche-like, uh, and uh, ultimately investors just won't be well served by them. We have time for like one or two more questions here, um, and we've had a bunch on two topics, so I'm going to sort of roll them into two general thoughts, and we'll start with the first one, um, Gus. Uh, you know, do you worry very much or at all, honestly, about people shorting ETFs? Uh, you know, we've certainly seen a few crazy examples where you see an ETF that looks like it's, you know, 500% short or something like that, and and obviously as the issuer, you guys don't have any people do with your product once it's out on the market, right? People can go short your product or they can be long your product. Uh, hopefully they use it for its intended purposes and have a good experience, but yet you have no way of controlling that. But is that something you guys pay attention to? And, and do you think that there's uh, any real concern when we see, you know, the seemingly, uh, you know, oxymoron situation of a fund that's more than 100% short? Um, it, it's certainly something we're aware of. It's, it's not something we're really concerned about. The, the most important thing is that the ETF is providing the return that it should. So, in other words, is it even if there's a, a large short uh, position in it, is it still arbitraged well to the underlying value? And that, to us, that's the most important thing. Uh, we don't think it's at all possible that an ETF could collapse. You know, I think uh, uh, the Bogan report. Uh, uh, propose that uh, somebody could redeem all of their uh, their ETF shares and, and collapse the ETF. Well, they'd have to have physical delivery or have physical possession of of 100 percent of the actual shares outstanding, and uh, that's essentially impossible to do. So, um, so I don't think uh, they could implode. And, and uh, just because you have a lot of shorts doesn't mean that they can't be arbitraged well to the underlying value. That's great. Um, I think I think with that we've used up our full hour. So um, I'd like to thank Gus uh, Gus Sauter of Vanguard for great slides and a great conversation. Uh, Dave Nodig, Director of Research here at Index Universe. You all can find out more uh, if you're interested at indexuniverse.com or vanguard.com. Um, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. As mentioned, we have another one coming up on Thursday. We'll hope you join us for that as well.
Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.